All right. Hi, avian science. It looks like everyone spotted this bird already. So I guess I don't need to show you the circled version, but if you didn't see it, it's right there. Guarantee though, if you didn't know there was a bird in the picture, you wouldn't have found it. Okay, assignments due tomorrow and new assignments will be posted tomorrow or possibly Saturday. We, you guys probably know by now that I don't always get them up on Fridays. Um, the project is due April 16th before midnight and presentations April 18th. So we're getting close. All right, last time we met, we were talking about breeding and we're gonna continue talking about breeding and reproduction in birds. We talked last time about newborn birds that we call precocial. These are the birds that when they hatch, they're able to walk, they're able to follow their parents around, they're often able to find their own food supply, or at least eat with their parent pointing out, this is food, eat this. Now we're gonna to go to the other end of the spectrum. These are altrical baby birds. Parrots and songbirds have babies who are not finished developing, not ready to go. They're much more primitive. They've got their eyes closed. They've got, when they're born, talk about, I'm sorry, the, these, even I don't think baby birds freshly hatched are cute. Um, pink skin, bare naked skin, often a big, big belly. That's food supply for the first day or two of life. They can barely hold their heads up. Ooh. Um, we can also call these birds nestlings. And nestlings means that they have to stay in the nest. There has to be some place for them to start to develop. The parents feed them, they bring them food, and the food is gonna be high protein insects. So even in species that eat seeds as adults, the babies need that extra protein. So the parents will feed them insects. The exception being the pigeons and the doves. Those the parents remember produce a crop milk and the crop milk has enough protein for them. So if the parents are bringing food, they have to bring higher protein foods. A lot of species will swallow the food and carry it in a crop and bring it back and regurgitate it for the food. Only later on bringing them full-size food that the babies can swallow. They, they, they do this to kind of pre-digest it because you can imagine if you're born looking like this, your digestive system is not fully mature yet and they may not be ready to digest full-sized foods. The nestling sage lasts about two to three weeks for most songbirds. And it can last up to a couple of months in larger birds that need more time to get big. So things like raptors and albatross, which are pretty big, uh, may take months. So size matters when you're a baby bird. The bigger you have to grow, the longer it's going to take. Once they leave the nestling stage, they are what we call fledglings. 
This is a fledgling. Fledglings are full grown. They are the same size as the adults. They are fully feathered, little asterisk here, um, and ready to learn to fly. So when we look for a bird, we look at a bird and we try and tell if it's a fledgling. This robin has no tail feathers. So it's not uncommon for fledgling birds to have short tails, shorter than what you would see in an adult. The other thing we see is this tissue right here by the edge of the beak. So this is a soft tissue. It's called a gape flange. So in order for the parent bird to put food in the baby's mouth, the baby's mouth has to open really wide. And so there's this soft tissue at the corners of the beak that allow the beak to open wider. As they mature, that soft tissue is no longer soft and flexible and they can't open as wide. So these are the two things you look at. If you see a bird on the ground, it's not flying very well or not flying at all. And you're not sure if it's an adult or still a, a young one. These are the things that characterize fledglings. Fledglings are still the parent on, still dependent on their parents. So parents are around. You probably won't see them. They may not be within sight. They may be out getting food, um, but they will protect the baby. They bring food to the baby and they teach the baby. So teaching can be lots of different things. It can be what song do we sing? It can be, how do we behave? How do we interact with others of our species? What are the things we need to be afraid of? What are our predators? And what do we eat and where do we find it? All of these things fledglings learn during a very short time period. Now, how much attention a bird needs and how long this fledgling stage lasts varies dramatically between species. Hummingbirds, very short time period here. They pretty much come out of the nest. It doesn't take them long to build up the muscles and learn how to fly. And they're very instinctual. They will go to the color red looking for food. So they don't need a lot of parental care. Other species like uh, the cranes that we were seeing the other day that need to follow their parents to the migration round, grounds. Uh, crows will often spend years with their parents learning how to be a crow. So it's highly, highly variable how long this time period lasts. Generally speaking for songbirds, yeah, month to two month time period here. So if you're getting the idea that for songbirds, the time from being laid as an egg to being an adult on your own, it's not very long. And if you think about it logically, how long is the summer? They have to be fully grown and capable of migrating by the end of the summer. So they need to mature quickly. So that's kind of the life cycle of birds, just kind of a, a brief highlight there. So I wanna talk now about breeding in captivity. So why? breed birds. What reasons might you have for breeding birds? Anybody? Rehabilitation of a species. Rehabilitation of a species, absolutely. Breeding an endangered species to increase their numbers, yeah. 
Anything else? Trying to reduce illegal pet trade. That's a good one. Yeah, trying to reduce the illegal pet trade. So you breed for pets and you breed for increasing the population of endangered species. I was gonna say, well, more of a person that gains the knowledge, but hopefully like, so people can like, that kind of goes with the endangered species. So like people, people might say, oh, like this bird's obviously like see new endangered species, yeah. Or like to save, like, cause you could save the old endangered ones, but then also but people may see a new variety or new species of bird, learn more about it, see that's actually endangered and then spread that to other people. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you mean when you say endangered species? That's what I mean when I say endangered species. Oh, uh, oh uh, that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was gonna say to maybe new, see if there are new chance of new traits. New traits, okay, like new colors? Yes, new colors, mm -hmm. yeah. I see Anna put in a comment, improving health and temperament. That would also be for the pet trade, um, trying to make healthier and easier to get along with birds. So absolutely, these are all valid reasons to breed birds. As Ronit pointed out, taking breeding captive populations reduces take from the wild. And the birds that are born and raised in captivity do better in captive situations. If you take a bird from the wild, it's not going to do as well in captivity. So, but here's the question. So yes. let's say, okay. Are you saying that you're breeding two birds that are already in captivity that baby comes from the parents from that and then it's also sold in captivity? Are you saying that like you find an egg that's in the wild and you put it in captivity? Like No, I'm saying you're breeding birds in captivity. Hold on. To produce- But like, you see what I'm asking, right? Because like you say, oh, like um, captive birds do better, but like were the parents originally captive or were they wild and now captive? Okay, okay. I, I kind of see what you're asking. Um, if you're breeding birds in captivity, does it matter if the parents were wild? Um, so... If you hand reared the chick, it doesn't matter if the parents were originally, as far as that chick goes, it doesn't matter if the parents were originally wild caught. Hopefully you're not going out and getting a pair of birds from the wild just to breed them because that kind of negates the whole advantage to breeding for the pet trade because you're taking birds from the wild. So like, this kind of goes to another question. So when you see like, um, let's, okay, so like we get um, conures, right, in our store. So the conure that we're getting is necessarily from parents that are bred in captivity. By law, they have to be. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, by law, they have to be. If they're being sold in a pet store, they have to be uh, captive bred. What about for zoos? That's something different. And that kind of approaches Jessica's comment or question in the um, chat. Zoos have exemptions that allow them to bring in wild caught birds with a lot of oversight, a lot of permits involved. 
And they do this, they bring in new wild caught birds to increase the genetic diversity of the captive population. So <clears throat> we want to maintain the genetic diversity of the wild species in case, and this does happen, zoos do this, in case the zoos are able to breed for release back into the wild to help build up the wild population again. Yeah, okay, yeah. so I see that. It's, so it's an order like save the species from extinction. Yes, yes, that's They're trying to save the species doing it from to be extinction. Rude, but like... Yeah, it's like it's it's plus. Can you turn minuses, your radio off, Laura? Plus. I have trouble understanding you. I was gonna say, so like it's like if you okay, so like you're not you're taking a bird from a while, but you're also saving it. Yes. Because you could possibly release more than you got from the wild. Yes. Okay. This has done this has been done to with great success with whooping cranes. It has been done with great success with the California condor. See, I knew I knew. See, that's funny, Jessica, because I knew something about I was just gonna say, I feel like I've heard of it with the foxes, but like I haven't heard it with birds. With foxes? Yeah, she said do to select a breeding the fox trial. Yeah, that's something completely different. Um, it looks like Jessica was asking about behavioral differences between wild birds and captive birds. If and and, and we have to talk about the, the two different reasons, the two different categories of why we breed. If we're breeding for the pet trade. Some behaviors do have a genetic component and theoretically we can breed to develop birds that are um, calmer, less prone to anxiety in captivity. That is where she's talking about the selective breeding in the foxes, which is a situation in Russia where they took foxes, not an endangered species of fox, just foxes, and they bred them selecting for the individuals who were calmest so that they were doing the best in captivity, and they ended up in a surprisingly short period of time with a, a group of foxes that behaved very, very similar to domestic dogs. They're not quite domestic dogs, but they're clearly on the way to being like a domestic species. It's hopeful that we can do this with birds because we do see with the species that have been in captivity for the longest periods of time that we successfully took them from a wild bird to a much calmer domestic bird. We saw that with pigeons. We can see it with budgies, with um, zebra finches, with canaries, and of course, with chickens. All of which we have selectively bred to be more domesticated. We can change the physical characteristics. Um, with birds, it's hard, excuse me, it's harder to change size. Um, can, we can do some changes to the appearance, um, mostly with color. Size is harder to change in, in birds. An individual species does not tend to come in multiple sizes. That doesn't mean that it's not possible over the long term. If we look at chickens, they range in size from what are called bantam chickens, which can be small enough to sit on your hand up to, you know, really big, massive chickens. 
Um, so the, the size range in them is huge. So it's possible that we can change the size of these birds. Yes. But it takes longer. Yes, it so, does. It takes a long time. Like coloration may be like something you, it's faster, but then the size, it just takes longer. Yes, exactly. Like years? Um, it's hard to give you a time period because it depends not so much on the time as the reproductive period of the species. So if we're talking about budgies, budgies can start breeding uh, at least as early as one year old, maybe earlier, I don't know for sure. And they can, you know, then that generation can start reproducing in one year and so on. So the reproductive time period is only a year. They will evolve either through breeding or through evolution much faster than something like a parrot, which won't reach sexual maturity until five, six, or seven years, because that just takes longer for them to reproduce. Okay. So I think we've covered most of this, some of the stuff I had in here. I may repeat myself a little bit here because we did have some really good questions. Um, and yes, Polish frizzles are seriously cute looking birds. Yeah. There's a, a podcast called Ologies. And this week they're talking about chickens. So um, she talks about all different things, but she's got a two part chicken episode going. And so I was listening to that on my drive home yesterday. And yeah, I came home and I started looking up chicken breeds and yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to tell my neighbor that because she has chickens. <laughs> there are lots of chicken breeds, lots and lots of them. I think I heard there were over 400 breeds of chicken. That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. <laughs> so now when we talk about breeding for captivity, we have to talk about ethics of birds in captivity. You guys probably have gotten an idea about my thoughts about pet birds um, and how I have mixed feelings about them. <laughs> um, I would really not mind if there were no longer pet parents. Parrots are I cute. I disagree with you on that. I 100% agree because yeah, they're so hard to take care of. And like, we have one, we have a um, finch that, you know, is available for adoption. And it's just like how, you know, they wanted to put it in with total, uh, they have a, a sun conure in with a canary. And they wanted to put the the finch in with that I'm like why okay it wouldn't work out like you know like there's just some people that don't do the research before they get the bird and I mean it's already a hard bird to take care of anyway yeah yeah so. um so there's a video that I usually have this class watch that I think we're not going to have the time for me to schedule it called parrot confidential um it's a really good video about the harsh realities of parrots as pets, and it'll break your heart. <laughs> um, it breaks my heart every time I watch it. Will I post it to Blackboard? I can post it to Blackboard, or at the link at least. That said, I think that if people had better 
understanding. Yeah, Laura, you probably saw it two years ago. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. That, yeah, that was the last time I had class with you, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, yeah. Um, I think that if people were better educated, I think budgies make fantastic pets. So I think pigeons make fantastic pets. So there's there's conflicted feelings about a lot of this, the, the ethics of keeping birds in captivity. And of course, we also have to talk about the ethics of zoos. I know that people have mixed feelings about these. Um, I do too. Some zoos do a good job, some do, zoos do a bad job. Whether we should have zoos at all, I think comes down to the fact that for most people, if they have never seen a, an animal in person, they're not gonna care about it. So I may feel iffy about it, but I think that there is a place for well-managed zoos. Okay. Now you're welcome to disagree with me. Not a problem. I don't know if I disagree. I'm like in between, but like, I don't, yeah, I'd have to think about, I mean, I'm definitely in between, but like, I don't disagree with you, like. Yeah. Yeah, Ronit put the comment in the chat as a teaching and research tool, they can be very important as long as it's done responsibly. Yes, they can also be a great place for breeding endangered species for release back into the wild. Lots of zoos will breed um, various species. The San Diego Zoo is well known for this. They were a major player in breeding condors for release into the wild, but they can also be places that breed turtles, endangered frogs, you know, things that don't tend to get a lot of support from nonprofits because people don't care as much about them. Okay. So you've decided. Oh God, petting zoos? Yeah, no. If we go I mean, beyond- Petting zoos can be a bacteria fest. Yeah, they really can. They really can. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're getting sidetracked again. <laughs> you almost got me jumping on my soapbox about roadside zoos that breed pubs for people to take pictures with, you know, lion cubs and stuff. Oh my God. Oh my God, that's a nice. I'm gonna have to mute you there. No, I'm kidding. No, yeah. that's, no that's not gonna small. talk about it. Not gonna talk okay, about okay. it. Yeah, the Tiger King there. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, so you've decided that you're gonna breed. So you have to ask questions. You have a male and female. Are these two birds male and female? Do you know? Can you tell? Some species you can tell sometimes. Sometimes you can tell during the breeding season, but a lot of times you can't tell. You can't, or as far as I know, you cannot tell if lovebirds are male or female. Males might have brighter color than females, but it's, it's not always the case. And you can't assume based on behavior, right? These two birds snuggled up together. You might think they're male and female because they're, you know, having snuggly time. They might even have private time together. Um, guys, I hate to break it to you. That's not a guarantee you have a male and a female. Birds are just like people, and you know, if you're if you've got one opportunity to have a sex life, a lot of people will take it regardless. A lot of birds will take it regardless. 
They don't have the hangups people do. What is the behavior of the what of the species? Is it a monogamous species? When we say monogamous, how are we defining that? In a lot of the smaller birds, monogamous means monogamous for this breeding season. Monogamous means um, two birds or two individuals stick together and, and they, they keep that mate. For life. It doesn't have to be for life. For life. It can be for the breeding season. So with small birds, it may be, we're gonna stick together. We're gonna raise chicks this year. Next year, we may or may not mate together again. We may switch. So does that include, so let's just say, okay, so they start breeding, but in during that period of like that whole breeding uh, part, one partner dies, mm -hmm. is that monogamous for like, or no? Because like yeah. they've already bred, they're just right now like waiting for the bird to actually hatch and like start raising it. But. Well, we, when we say whether a species is monogamous or not, we're talking about the general behavior of the species, not what an individual bird does. So for some species, it takes two adults to raise babies, period. So if one of the pair dies, if the survivor cannot attract a new partner to the nest, then they won't be able to raise the babies. It does mean, oh, well, it does mean only one partner at a time, except in birds, it doesn't. So let me, let me try and explain this more clearly. We're going to call this serial monogamy. And this is in the small birds mostly. And that means two birds pair up, breed, raise the babies together. Next year, they may change partners. But Birds have a very high rate of um, what's politely called extra pair populations. In other words, they cheat on each other a lot. No, I remember oh. that. You're saying that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Usually, if you take the genetic information of a, of a clutch of baby birds, you will find that there are multiple fathers for that nest. So mom has gone out and, you know, had some fun with the neighbors, but dad's doing it too. So some of his babies are in other nests. This is very, very, very common. That's kind of wild. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I don't even, I can't even imagine, but like, because it's birth, but I mean, I guess they're just trying to be successful. They're trying to be successful, yeah. The more genetic diversity in your children, the more likely some of them will survive. We do hear about some species that mate for life. So we hear about this with swans, with albatross, with a lot of the bigger, longer lived birds, with parrots. Parrots are, are known for this. Mating for life is exactly the same thing as what happens in people. Humans get married, say till death do us part, and sometimes that works and sometimes they get divorced. Sometimes they have affairs. Birds do the same things. So mating for life is exactly what happens in people. Same 
sort of, we say it's one thing, but it's really not. Okay. So you, you kind of have to know the behavior of the species to know, can you or should you have different partners each time you want to breed? Or is it a species that's gonna do better if they have the same partner? So parrots are gonna do better if they have the same partner over and over again. In captivity, breeding pairs may break up. And sometimes this is violent. Just like when people break up, somebody's throwing the dishes around, right? Getting all violent, angry. This can happen with birds in captivity. One partner may attack and drive off the mate. This is particularly common if it's breeding season, but there's no place to nest, no nesting material, no supplies. So if you have a male and female pair and you do not want to breed them, you need to make sure they don't get in the breeding mood. So what causes birds to get in the mood to breed? Hormones. Longer day length, which triggers the hormones. Yeah. So how do you stop birds from breeding? Keep day length. Day length. the same year round. So this goes back to covering the cage at night. So your birds don't get this hormonal urge in the spring. You also need to be aware that even if you try this, you may need to separate birds. So you should always be prepared to separate your birds if they quit getting along, especially related to breeding. The next thing we need to consider is genetics. You should not breed closely related birds. Just like you should not breed closely related dogs, just like you shouldn't breed closely related cats or horses or anything. If you want to breed, you need to do your genetics research on that particular species. You wanna say what kinds of genetic diseases are most common? Does your bird have those genetic diseases? Can they pass them off to the offspring? So this is going back to what was talked about at the beginning, to breed for healthier individuals. Breeding for health means knowing what genetic diseases or, um, I'm gonna call it genetic weaknesses, are common and doing your best to avoid breeding animals with those. Birds that are closely inbred, that are bred to relatives, you're more likely to have offspring with uh, health issues. If you don't know your birds are related, you probably shouldn't breed them. If you want to breed, you should talk to someone who is breeding, who knows the lineage of the birds that they are selling. If you're getting something from a pet store, you have no idea what the background of that individual bird is. Can you test 
for genetic diseases in birds. Just like dogs, just like humans, we do not always know what genes are involved in diseases. So that while there are some things that we can test for in humans, there are genetic conditions that we cannot test for. I suspect there's less information about genetic diseases in birds than there is in humans or dogs. Because remember, when we're talking, if you talk about dogs, dogs are all the same species. Chihuahuas to Great Danes, they have certain genes that we can, we can say they have these genes in common with each other. When we're talking about birds, they're different species. And so something that would be a genetic disorder in African gray parrots, if we're talking about cockatoos from Australia or macaws from South America, they're not that closely related at all. That's like trying to compare genetic diseases in dogs with genetic diseases in seals. Dogs and seals are kind of related to each other, but not very much. So there's just not a lot of information out there. When we are talking about breeding, we have to think about caging. So you need a large cage. You need a space that is big enough for the parents and big enough for their offspring. How big? Well, that depends. And it depends on whether you're gonna let the parents raise the babies or if you're gonna hand rear them. And then you need to find a place for a nest. So some birds are cavity nesters. We see this with a lot of the parrots and you can build a nest box. So this is a nest box. Um, the front door is on a hinge or the front is also a door, it's on a hinge so you can open it take a peek inside, that's valuable. And the parents will go in, give them some nesting material, let them lay their eggs. Having an access for you to clean makes it easier to clean between seasons. And you should, you should between breeding seasons, or pull the nest out or pull the nest box out, empty it out, clean it with bleach. Some smaller birds, they have these baskets. I think I've shown you pictures of these. These are one use nesting um, structures for small birds like the finches. Some birds will build on a platform or on branches. So you can have something like this, which is an artificial nest as the basic. Uh, structure for them to build in. Again, that gets tossed at the end of the season. If you have a large aviary and you're looking at small birds, you can put hanging baskets in there. Your, your finches, your canaries would love to nest in a hanging basket. Now, the plant may end up dying because you can't water it, but the birds would like it. Just make sure that there's no pesticides used on the plant before you put it in there. You have to supply materials. Again, I think I've talked about this. Um, there are things that work pretty good. Facial tissues work pretty good. Short coconut fibers work pretty good. Broad leafed grasses 
as long as they weren't grown with pesticides or oh, berries. Do you prefer artificial plants or not? Like, um, um, for inside the cage? Yes. Um, I would not personally, but then I'm a big plant person and I would just make my own hanging baskets, grow my own plants. Um, you can use strips of paper. These are good materials. No hair, no thread. Not dog hair, not cat hair, not people hair. Hair can wrap around the baby bird's legs and cut off circulation. So that's a concern. And of course, if we're talking pigeons and doves or quail, they're gonna nest on the ground. They may want a sheltered area, some kind of canopy that provides some sort of cover. You have to worry about the parent bird's health. You want the parents in good condition. So you want both parents to have vet checks. You want the vet to check for sexually transmitted infections. You wanna check their weight, make sure they're a healthy weight. And don't let females breed too often. So some species like zebra finches will breed you out of house and home. They will just breed and breed and breed and breed and breed. And when that happens, that can deplete the calcium stores. So Calcium is stored in our bodies and in bird bodies in the bones. So depleting the calcium stores damages the bones. And that low calcium level can also lead to egg binding. So calcium is also important for muscle contraction. So if there's not enough calcium, the female might not be able to lay the egg. All right, so you've considered all of this complexity. The next question you have to think about, chickens have egg binding a lot, that wouldn't surprise me. They've been bred to lay more eggs than um, their wild ancestors did. So the next question is, are you gonna let the parents raise it or are you going to hand rear the babies? The easy way for people is to let the parents raise the babies. You've gotta handle the babies a lot when they're young to make them more comfortable with people. Some parents are not comfortable with this and they're, they're gonna get upset. It's not your scent. You don't have to worry about that. If the parents are very comfortable with people, they'll probably be comfortable with you handling their chicks. Um, the thing you have to worry about is keeping them warm. So the parents will reject chicks if they get cold. The reason being the parents think, well, it's getting cold, it's dying. And I don't wanna put any effort into this chick because it's dying and it might spread diseases to the other chicks. So just let it die or they may even kill it. So what is hand rearing? What are we talking about here? This is when you remove the chick from the parents and raise it yourself. 
there are pros and cons to this. A hand reared bird is going to be much, much more comfortable with people. So if the bird's gonna stay in captivity, this is good. You do not want to hand rear a bird that is going to be released into the wild, however. If you do wildlife rehabilitation, you should know, you should get trained in how to avoid handling the baby birds as much as possible. So you are as hands off as possible in wildlife rehab. You're as hands on as possible if the bird's gonna be a pet. Wild birds that get a lot of attention from people will often seek out people after release. This could be bad, right? A lot of people are not gonna like it if a crow flies down and begs for food. Um, at, at best, the person is upset. At worst, the person may try and kill the bird or try and handle the bird and get bitten. Or if it's a, a hawk or an owl, injured. So, If captivity is going on, as I've said, birds more comfortable in captivity, lower stress lifestyle, but there's an increased risk of things like separation anxiety as the bird matures. And there's an increased likelihood that the bird will decide that a person is their mate. And if the person is their mate, they're gonna do things like regurgitate on you. Scream when you leave the work, the room. Hand reared birds are more likely to fight. They're more likely to, um, you know, masturbate on your shoulder. You're their mate. You're not satisfying them. They're going to try. So these are three different pictures of a palm cockatoo, which is being hand raised at a place in the UK, um, either for zoo populations, captive populations, or, or to um, be released back into the wild. I'm showing you this because we're gonna talk about how you feed these birds. So you've decided to hand rear. You got to keep that baby warm. You may need to buy an incubator. So this is an incubator behind this parrot here. And in the previous slide, um, there's an incubator off to the side here. Incubators will maintain a constant temperature keep the baby warm. It does need to be cleaned regularly. And between breeding seasons, it needs to be cleaned with either bleach or vinegar, something that's going to, or some of these uh, products that are designed for vet's office that will really kill lots of bacteria and viruses. If you are raising a chicken in an incubator, you have to make a nest. Baby birds can get injured very easily if they don't have an appropriate nest structure. So nestlings really, I mean, you can see in this picture, this guy's, he's sitting on his butt. He can't stand up. Um, so if they're not given some nest support, they're, um, more likely to injure their legs. I see there's a comment. Would there, what reason would there be to not buy an incubator if you were planning to hand rear? Um, really, you should have an incubator if you're planning to hand rear. Uh, the only exception would be if you're doing 
sharing the responsibilities with the parent birds and maybe you let the parents raise them for the first week to week and a half and then you pull them and finish the rearing process. Because once they get a covering of, you know, uh, downy feathers and quill feathers, then they, they generally don't need an incubator at that point. So how do you build a nest? Getting some kind of small bowl, maybe one of those disposable uh, nests that I showed you a picture of earlier, and basically lining it with tissues. Tissues without lotion, please. So I'm talking about these guys here. You can even cut the box in half and use the bottom half of the box for nesting. Uh, so you line it with tissues. You can change the tissues regularly. As I said, no lotion, please. And that's, that's needed until the bird reach, reaches about the fledgling stage, which if we're talking about budgies, um, canaries, finches, we're talking three to four weeks. It's not very long. If we're talking about parrots, we're talking about a couple of months. The next thing that we have to worry about is food. When we are talking about a nestling, a little thing like this, we're talking about a liquid diet. Um, yes, you can see this guy's here has a one cc syringe with no needle attached and is using that to feed the bird. You can use a syringe, you can use an eyedropper. You want to put a little drop in the mouth, pull the eyedropper or the syringe away and let them swallow that and then repeat. Here's the thing. So do you some people will say oh so like if you because it already has already been used so can you wash can you quash it or should you not like wash it should you wash syringes like, absolutely yeah um, like, like, like saying like the tube, like so like you wouldn't use your regular soap you would use like a like a safe yeah, you could use uh, you can use Dawn. Dawn is perfectly safe for this kind of thing. Oh, okay. So they can like in oh, so they can um say like if they accident like you know some like leftover residue and Dawn is in that that won't kill them. Dawn is very very safe for birds. Okay. Yeah. Basically, what you have to do is pull soapy water up and down through the syringe. And then you can pull the plunger out of most syringes and let both parts dry separately. You wanna make sure you give them time to swallow and you can see on this palm cockatoo, the crop, you're gonna see that easier on parrots than on other birds. Um, parrots and doves are, are the ones you're gonna be able to see this most easy on. Finches, it's not as obvious. You want to make sure that crop is empty before you feed them again. If you don't make sure that crop is completely empty, you can cause something called sour crop. Um, I think I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Well, probably next week, but it's going to, it's coming up. If it's empty, it would not be bulging out like that. Yeah, this is a full crop. Okay. Even on a liquid diet, babies can get dehydrated. So it's useful to give them a few drops of water a couple of times a day to help with that. If the baby refuses to eat, 
dehydration may be a problem. The nice thing about if you're trying to get water into a baby bird is that if you put a drop of water right here at the corner of the mouth, the water will go into the mouth. It'll, it'll just kind of dribble between the upper and lower beak. So you don't have to convince the bird to open the beak. The formula should be room temperature. You don't want it too cold. You don't want it too hot. But you have to refrigerate it between feedings. So the way I've done it when I worked in wildlife rehab, you would have the formula made up and you would put it into a series of small containers. And each container might have about one feeding worth of food. We would always use baby food jars. You can use small Tupperwares uh, or anything else you can find. And then you bring it out of the refrigerator about an hour before feeding and let it get to room temperature. Do not microwave the food. So room temperature, but no microwaves. What if I'm microwaving it? Dehydrate it? It's, well, it'll dry it up a little bit, but more importantly, it can um, destroy some of the nutrients. Some of the vitamins get broken down. Uh, okay. Different species have different nutritional requirements. Duh. Um, your local pet store might or might not have appropriate foods. So you want to make sure you have the food before you try and raise these babies. your pet store, the food that's there, you want to kind of get an idea of how long it's been sitting on the shelf. So hopefully it would have an expiration date on it. So you wanna look for that because just like microwaving, sitting on the shelf, some vitamins break down, especially if the container is clear. So if you're planning on hand feeding, you may want to order fresh food from an online source. Now, if your species has a pelleted diet, so you find a pelleted di diet specifically for your bird, you can mash that up, moisten it, and use that to feed nestlings. Make sure you're doing your some research on that first though, because baby birds need more proteins than adults and the pellets may or may not have enough protein for the chicks. As soon as the baby is large enough, large enough, generally we're talking, they've got a covering of pin feathers, they are no longer in the um, incubator, they can hold their heads up better, they can sit up. Then we wanna start with the solid foods. And solid foods would be, perfect transition there, Daniel, things like moistened pellets, like the adults would eat, um, that are kind of mushy, but also you can feed them mealworms, especially if you soak the mealworms in water, that helps with hydration. And you can put a little bit of vitamins in the water. We're gonna talk about vitamins when we talk about nutrition next week. If you're putting, if you're making vitamin enriched water, you don't want to leave, you don't wanna use that for very long because um, vitamins can increase the growth of bacteria in water. Black soldier fly larva, I think that would work just fine, yeah. I mean, I used mealworms as the example because they're so easy to find. 
Oh, I mean, I first time someone bought wheel worms, I'm like, oh, so you're feeding a lizard? No, I'm feeding a bird. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, I, I, okay. I was like, that's, uh, I never knew that, but I, apparently they do that. And I was like, okay. So, but they can't they choke on that. Not if you're being careful when you feed them. Okay. You would be surprised at how small of a bird can swallow a whole mealworm. So, I mean, that's, good. that's pretty impressive. Uh, you can also cut up small pieces of vegetables and fruit. Diversity is important in an adult bird's diet. It's important for your babies. So cut up some apples, some strawberries, some broccoli. You said uh, stay away from kale, correct? Stay away from kale, yep. Yep. Okay. So when we talk about crops, we've talked about these before. We all know what these are by now. It's a sac right here at the base of the throat that some species use to store food for later, which is great if you're feeding the baby because that means you don't have to feed them as often. If you overfill a crop, or if you don't allow the crop to empty before the next feeding, you can start, you can have a condition where you start having bacteria or fungus growing in the crop. And that is called sour crop. Even highly experienced people sometimes get sour crop in chicks that they're hand rearing. If you think that there's a problem, call your vet. This is not something that will go away on its own. And it um, can very easily be fatal. If you are If you've got a clutch of babies and you hand rear one, but not the others, you're taking that one away from the siblings. If you introduce it back to its siblings, they haven't grown up with it. They're gonna consider it a stranger. Whether they bully it or not, it's going to depend on the individual birds and their personalities. Okay, so what? So just, I mean, she wants. So just, should I say, oh, I would recommend not hearing hand rearing it. Um, I would recommend if she wants them to continue to live together. Either okay. hand rear them all or don't hand rear them all, one or the other. Okay, cool, thanks. Even so, there's no guarantee they'll get along as adults. Now, if we look at non parrots, if we look at birds that I'm going to call them non crop birds. This doesn't mean they don't have a crop, but it's not as big and well-developed as what you see in parrots and pigeons. So we're talking about things like songbirds, like canaries and the finches. These might have to be fed every 15 minutes during the day when they're freshly born. That's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. The time between feedings will increase as the birds mature. So you don't have to feed them every 15 minutes the whole time, but certainly for the first few days. Now, how do you get the birds to eat the food? 
if you pull them when they're very young, they will respond to um, activity near the nest by gaping or opening their mouth big. So this guy's gaping right here. So you can try things like gently tapping the nest or blowing on the bird. These will often get nestlings to open up. You feed birds slowly and carefully. If we're talking about an older nestling, these can be kind of um, slower to gain. If they're not used to people, if they haven't seen people before, they may not respond in the same way. And again, tapping the nest gently, blowing on the birds, those kinds of things help because they stim simulate a parent bird flying in and landing on the nest. Fledglings, frankly, become a nightmare. If you wait until the fledgling stage and then you're trying to, the birds still need to be fed by the parents or by you, if they haven't been fed by people up to that point, it is really hard to get them to start feeding. Now, pigeons and doves, weirdos. Um, instead of the parent putting food in the pigeon or the dove, the pigeon or the dove baby sticks its beak into its mom or dad's mouth down to the crop and slurps up that crop milk. So you can train them to gape, but that's not natural for them. Okay, you guys have had lots of good questions today. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Do you have any more questions on this part? If you want to hand rear, it's a good idea to get some experience. Learn from somebody who's a breeder or volunteer with wildlife rehab place that raises birds. Learn how to feed them um, before you try it yourself. It's very easy to feed too fast or to get food down in the lungs instead of in the stomach. Um, and, you know, if it gets in the lungs, that can cause pneumonia and that can be very fatal. The weaning age for babies is usually, it's a slow process, slow process, relatively slow process. So they will be fledglings before they will be fully able to feed themselves. Um, Exactly how long after fledging, there's going to be variability between species and how you are doing the weaning process. So when you, you start being able to feed them with tweezers, the next step, once their eyes are opened, they're fledged, then you can start putting food on the bottom of their enclosure in a, in a very shallow dish, baby food lids, baby food jar lids work perfectly for small ones. You take food with your tweezers from the dish, put it in their beak. Food from the dish, put it in their beak. You're demonstrating this is what you do. You pick up the food and then you eat it. Some birds pick it up quick, some slower, but it's definitely, we're talking fledgling stage. Any other questions? Oh, did I have fun, but I forgot it. Okay, well, if you remember it over the weekend, you can write it down and I'll answer it on Tuesday. Okay. Okay. I'll probably re I'll remember it right after this class. Trust me, it always happens like that. Yep. <laughs> That's normal. <laughs> All right.
everybody have a good weekend. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Diane, I had a question about my grade. Okay, hang on a second. Let me stop the recording process.